The Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome our panelists, Davi Barker from ShinyBadges.com. How's it going? Christoph Atlas from AnonymousBitcoinBook.com. Hey, it's good to be here. Will Pangman from Bitcoin Milwaukee. Thanks for having me again. And Marnie Melrose from MidasMarty.com. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Issue 1, net neutrality dead. The FCC says they don't... The FCC says they like net neutrality, but they don't know what it is. They don't understand that the end-to-end -end network neutrality is one of the fundamental and underlying principles of the Internet that allows for small businesses to compete with large ones. It is the feature of the Internet that prevents absolute monopoly and encourages innovation, and has been struck down by myopic idiots. Davi Barker, your thoughts. I don't get it. I've um I've disagreed with people about this net neutrality thing for a long time. I think that a freer and opener market for internet service providing is a better solution than price fixing. So um, I don't know that this is a good thing because I don't know how sort of fascized the internet service providing industry is. But in general, it sounded like a bad idea in the first place. Christoph Atlas. Well, um, as a, a sort of laissez-faire capitalist, um, I quite agree with Davi that price fixing is generally not the optimal solution. Uh, basically, the problem <clears throat> is not so much that um, you know companies or corporations will be allowed to charge extra money for extra speeds or, or anything like that. The real problem is that we have incredibly monopolistic or duopolistic uh, organizations providing internet service in the United States. It's pathetically bad. There's just a few, you know, wherever you go, there might be two or three max um, internet service providers that you can have, just a handful of uh, phone providers, and even the most of the phone providers that you can get are just piggybacking off of a couple different uh, networks. So uh, that's the real problem here, that governments have created and erected these incredible barriers to entry to provide internet service to other people. And that's, that's what we need to ha have to defeat. Um, as far as what's going to be you know, passed as a law or whatever, I mean, you can sign all the White House.gov uh, petitions you want, but uh, it's not going to do a damn thing. They're pretty much going to do whatever they, they feel like they can get away with. And so what we need to focus on is creating alternatives. Um, I think mesh networking is very uh, promising. And in particular, Mesh networking is now uh, much more viable ever than ever before because we have a price, price discovery mechanism called cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin. And so I think that um, there's definitely some real possibility for us to re-examine the way that we do internet. Of course, there's MadeSafe recently. We'll talk a little bit later in the program about MadeSafe. But um, I, I think that we'll have some alternatives coming around the bend, and hopefully they come soon enough in order to uh, counteract these legal uh, these legal changes. Well, Pangman. Yeah, um, I, w I was going to say, you know, I think in some way, I, tr I try to always find a way to look on the bright side here, and nothing encourages me more than watching all the innovation in the cryptocurrency space and how fast it happens. And the reason it happens so fast is because you don't have to ask permission to get involved. You don't have to ask permission to, you know, um, commit to, uh, commit progress to any uh, open source code that's out there and a lot of in a lot of these new technologies. So you you've got everyone from 12 year olds to, you know, first generation uh, computer users, you know, contributing in this space and they're doing so in their free time, they're volunteering and um, you know, this is happening at such a blinding rate. Anyone who's spent even a few months in Bitcoin, you know, consuming the the, the news media that comes out from Bitcoin sources and such, uh, you're immediately aware of how quick things move in this space. So I'm encouraged because if um, these choke points are created, 
and um, squeezed more tightly than even, as Christoph mentioned, the already you know choking aspect of monopolies and duopolies. I mean, much of the country, you know, between the coasts, uh, has not even just two choices; they just have one choice for a provider for high-speed internet. So, um, yeah, this is going to bring to market uh, uh, so many more alternatives so much more quickly than they could ever be counteracted by the powers that shouldn't be, as I like to call them. So. Yeah, I'm encouraged. Um, I wouldn't have. The only reason I'm not like you know, up in arms or whatever about this FCC ruling, and you know whatever protests and subsequent rulings and things will have to come out is because this is a, to be expected. You know, we're this is no surprise. Um, I'm not surprised that my many Democrat and liberal friends are very disappointed by the leaders that they voted for. I'm not surprised that they're saying this stuff. And um, so, but I am encouraged that there's all all kinds of op alternatives in place in development already, and they'll be here faster than we think. And um, it's you know it's not it's not the cleanest ride, but this is what's fun about um, about all of these innovations and, and participating in the cryptocurrency world uh, is you get to actually see some things that we've been waiting really decades for. So this is interesting times. Marnie Melrose. Well, I don't know a heck of a lot about the whole thing. I know I don't like um, what's happening. <laughs> but I do agree with Will. Um, and I'm a laissez-faire capitalist, just like Kristoff. And so I'm, I'm kind of I'm excited at the same time because whenever you get um, a situation where people cannot, right, then especially in a, in a country like America, people say, well, wait a minute, maybe we can. And that kind of actually fuels the growth faster than if we had, we were too comfortable, right? So when we're, and, and you know, we're talking about Bitcoin in, in the world of, of uh, you know, how fast it spreads and everything. And here in America, it doesn't spread so fast because we're a little bit too comfortable. And so, again, when things get uncomfortable, then sometimes it actually has that impetus of actually moving us forward faster. It does seem like it might be, although painful and uncomfortable, a good advertisement for what was so good about net neutrality in the first place. And basically, Davi, the reason we need net neutrality is it allowed Netflix to happen. Without net neutrality, Netflix never would have been able to stream their video and to get their position they would have had to pay a gatekeeper to stream their video, which they wouldn't have been able to do until after they'd gained their position. I'm sorry, but like economically speaking, that sounds like who will build the roads. I mean, like, just, just because... Well, there's, a, there's a networking principle here that networking actually works like this. It's not an Ayn Rand situation. Like, networking is actually passing along other people's packets. Like, delivering other people's mail is part of networking. So if you want to have a network, like, if you want to have a network of computers that don't share with each other, a selfish network is going to be weaker than this network that shares with each other. Then it would not succeed. If, uh, if, 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 if the possibility exists for people to create multiple networks and one paradigm is superior to the other, that's the one that people will choose. I mean, that, that is what laissez-faire capitalism well, means, a, that's what freedom and free markets means. Popularity where the entrenched internet has a certain popularity. And if we were going to, say, start an Internet 2, we would have to compete with Internet 1, which has now been corporatized. Yeah, absolutely. And the existing roads have a certain popularity. And if I wanted to build a privatized road, I would have that barrier to entry before I would have the network effect of transportation to succeed. Yeah. Well, these it used doesn't to be our mean... roads that they're privatizing. These were the that... public roads, and they're privatizing them. Yeah, so, and that, that the really are... sucks. Yeah. The roads yeah. are a good uh, example, though, because there are very, very few uh, privatized roads in the United States because you can't just keep building more and more roads. Like, you kind of have to use these existing channels, and when you have a monopoly over those existing channels and it's, it's critical space that you cannot, that is not open to the free market, that's not open to competition, then that's when these kind of, these tactics with net neutrality and so forth come into play. Well, that's the system we have now with the cable companies continuing to merge and consolidate power mm -hmm. into this position where if you like Netflix, you're going to have to pay for a fast lane on the Internet is what we're looking at. I wanted to say something, but um, Marnie, Marnie had something to chime in, I think. Oh, so um, I, 
what's happening right now too on the internet is that the BRIC countries are actually creating routers that route the data around the United States because the United States is actually becoming very very disruptive to the global internet and I don't think long term that this is actually going to help America I think that we're we're really shooting ourselves in the foot here we have this internet that's a universal innovation engine and we're making it less innovative absolutely to, to Davi and Tom's um, little back and forth there you know uh, I agree with Davi about you know the market usually if, if left unfettered will the you know the cream rises but there are cases where um, you know like um, I, I'm not going to carry the analogy through but where like the second or third best or most the th second or third most optimal product ends up winning out like in the case of VHS and Betamax is one example that comes to mind but then that's that's due to network effects um, um, growing and like you know the gestation period of network of uh, you know building network effect but um, yeah I, I mean this is an interesting point because you know it's um, there's these community technologies uh, and Christoph brought up the point that like there is no private there's no real like private road system that's an alternative to the current road system you know there's not, not even on a small scale like for example if all streets and county highways and um, state highways were like you know the private roads and just the freeways were the public road like there isn't that it's all public pretty much there's very few private roads um, you know gated communities is it pretty much so if I mean let's think of like these lanes in the sky you know if, if some someone invented something that allowed you to put lanes in the sky and, and vehicles or whatever in the sky you could have an alternative to the existing system that would be obviously superior and um, you know m then would clearly win out and it, 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 this is like I'm trying to carry the analogy through of like um, the you know the status quo like cryptocurrencies come along and there are these roads this road in the sky all of a sudden and more and more people start using it and it just starts growing so much faster than even the people on the ground can realize you know and then you know the jurisdiction goes up to you know the heavens or whatever so now they're trying to you know um, reach and grasp up there so yeah I mean are we, it's just a race to it's just a race to the heavens right you know more alternatives can be built on top of whichever one starts the octopus's tentacles can grasp, right? Here, so. Here's the challenge, though, with that analogy, okay? So if you think, like, for instance, um, there's the 5 freeway that goes up to Orange County, and then there's the 73 freeway, right? Um, the thing is, is that we're not talking about something like that. We're talking about there's the big pipes, right? And there's only so much bandwidth that is distributed actually to the ISPs okay the big pipes across the oceans are like covalent or whatever the heck those company names are the big big companies right that have the massive pipes and they're the ones that are actually selling it down onto the ISPs so the ISP actually only gets you know they have a DS3, OC3, whatever all of them I can't remember all of them at the moment so you're getting this much and then basically what they're saying is I get this much and I'm going to charge more for this much to these people um, but I have to squeeze these people down a little bit and they have to get less because I don't get more right and, and that's where the, that analogy doesn't quite fit entirely it's it's a little bit different because there's only so much that they're going to get in the first place so aside from the economic debate on this issue there's also the who watches the watchers problem and that is that you're appealing to the federal government to solve this economic so-called market failure and the thing about the federal government is they like build these Trojan horses they build these like like laws that are meant to appeal to everyone and there's feds in those horses okay so it's like it's like you're asking the you're asking the agency that wants to surveil you that wants to track all of your internet activity that wants to that wants to squash speech that wants to squash dissent and you're saying hey would you please manage 
who gets access to the internet and how much and how fast. Mm -hmm. Like, it just strikes me as a, as a tremendous conflict of interest. And the thing about it is activists don't read these bills. Politicians who vote on them don't read these bills. But I'm willing to bet you that within these bills, there's all kinds of unrelated things that are about seizing power over traffic, not freeing traffic. It seems that all we were asking them to do were to maintain an unmanaged system the same unmanaged system that we've been enjoying for the last 20 years or so. Moving on, issue two, eBay flirts with Bitcoin. It's a competitive world out there, Amazon, and sometimes you can't give your customers what they want. You have to give them what they need. Wow. eBay, the world's largest marketplace and owner of dated old world currency transfer system, PayPal, most famous for cutting off funding to WikiLeaks is considering accepting Bitcoin. Could eBay, the marketplace of the past, also be the marketplace of the future if they accept Bitcoin? And what happens to PayPal? Christoph, Atlas. Well, every time we've talked about PayPal in the past, I've been confused about exactly how this works out favorably for PayPal. Um, I know that people have said that, you know, PayPal, they have this reputation, they have these coders, they, they're they competent at building secure payment systems, but it's hard for me to see how they manage to segue from, you know, getting 2 or 3% uh, plus off of everyone's transactions for the, long, for the longest time, and having some legally enforced monopolies as well, to becoming a trusted Bitcoin provider, where they're getting, uh, you know, a fraction of a percent. It's hard for me to imagine that large of a segue in as short a period of time is going to be necessary for PayPal because there's the window of opportunity for them to become, you know, this leader as a Bitcoin third-party service is closing. They're going to be competing with BitPay. They're going to be competing with Coinbase. They'll be competing with tons of other entrepreneurs that want to get into the space. And so um, I think you know if they're going to if they're going to make the move, it's going to have to be relatively soon. But I'm st I still have a hard time imagining how they this, they make this work for them. So it's interesting for me to hear this news coming out from eBay as opposed to PayPal. Uh, eBay sort of they you know they sort of own PayPal and. This makes me think that perhaps um, eBay is sort of uh, edging towards the exit when it was, as far as PayPal is concerned, cutting their losses and moving towards the next payment technology, or just making sure they have their foot in, the, in that door so that if they need to do so, they, they're ready to make the move. Will Pangman. Yeah, I mean, I, there's no reason why we shouldn't see cryptocurrencies being accepted by PayPal. It's another line of business for them. You know, it's probably very easy, I mean, you know, the, the same amount of volume of transactions isn't going to produce the same revenues for them, but it's just another stream of business. I mean, people are not going to stop using credit cards, um, you know, for a long time, perhaps. So um, as another line of business for eBay to look into accepting cryptocurrencies, it just it makes complete sense. It'll lower, um, you know, that line of business, I think, will provide a, a large growth to the e-commerce side of, of how cryptocurrencies are put to use and also um, you know, bringing a lot more users to the space. So all signs point to yes. I don't know why a lot of these um, usual suspects, like PayPal frequently comes up, wouldn't you know, figure out, you know, take a look at what Circle's doing, take a look at what Coinbase and BitPay are doing, and just you know, take some of that, try to take some of that market share for themselves with a new line of business, a new department. You know? So um, it's, it'd be great. I mean, I think uh, you know a lot of the people out there in Silicon Valley very smart. They see the writing on the wall. I think you know when you have people with um, huge stakes in many different industries, like say Richard Branson, come out and say that you know our, the financial system as we know it is on the brink. Um, then I think you're going to take notice, and you're going to you know you're going to start strategizing exits. I mean. You know, and the offshore stuff too, like uh, these barges offshore, data centers offshore, cities offshore. I think um, you know have a lot. Uh, they'll have a lot to say in the development of um, this topic, the eBay accepting Bitcoin topic, and even the last topic, the FCC and net neutrality stuff. So 
Um, people in, on Silicon Valley are doing this slowly but surely. They may not be talking about it, but I like to hear the rumblings. Marnie Melrose. Hi. Um, well, I think it's interesting to listen to the distinction between eBay saying this versus PayPal. And, and not to get the two confused, because there's separate CEOs in each company. And they were talking just as recently as last year about separating the two companies. And so there's a lot of internal discussion going on there. And I think we want to be careful about not getting the two confused because I, I think that they are two completely separate companies. Um, I can absolutely see where it would be in eBay's favor to accept PayPal. Um, you know, why not? Um, and do they think that, you know, uh, PayPal could one, you know, Bitcoin into it? Probably. Um, and the reason they're probably not thinking that it's that much of a conflict either is because the thing is, is that humans are, and, and you guys know this, right? We love Bitcoin. We're technologically adept, right? But the thing is, is that there's a lot of people, our aunts, our mothers, our grandmothers, they like what they know. They're very safe and they feel okay in there, right? And at first they didn't feel okay and there was phishing attacks and all of that. But now they're in there, they're in their little bubble, they're in their little cocoon and, and they feel safe. So if somewhere where they feel safe offers Bitcoin now, they're probably going to feel safer about that than if it was out in this brand new company that I don't know, right? And so I just think that we need to pay attention to who's saying what because they are very distinctive, two different things. Um, I, I would just, you know, wait until we hear what PayPal has to say before we try to think about what they might be trying to do. <laughs> Davi Barker. I, I miss BitMit. I don't know if you guys ever used BitMit, but it was essentially the eBay of Bitcoin, and it worked fantastically, and um, they went out of business for some reason. I'm not really sure why, and I haven't seen a auction Bitcoin, an, a Bitcoin auction site reemerge. So there's definitely a demand for that. As somebody who sells merchandise, I, I have sort of been um, twisted into going back to eBay and going back to PayPal since BitMit left. But here's the thing. eBay is pretty hostile to selling Bitcoin stuff. Like, if I put the word Bitcoin in the description of a product, they accuse me of selling an alternative currency in violation of their terms of service, and I'm selling a T-shirt. right? So they're making the same mistake that the TSA is making. Um, but... You know, I've said this before, they're going to come kicking and screaming eventually. When PayPal and eBay first started, they didn't examine U.S. monetary policy and say, are we going to accept the dollar or not? They did it because it was normal. And so as Bitcoin becomes normal, they're going to just adopt it because it's sort of the, it's, it's the water the fish are swimming in. Yep. So um, it's just a matter of time. If they, if they make this step, I think it's still early enough that it's bold of them, but they're coming eventually. I think Christoph's right that eBay and PayPal are two separate companies, and like Marnie said, and that, but eBay will cannibalize PayPal to accept Bitcoin. PayPal is just another user list, and Marnie's right. Maybe PayPal will have some legacy payment value, like AOL. Oh, I used to pay people on PayPal, so I still do. Uh, we've all seen the Circle announcement this morning. Circle has basically exposed themselves to be like a PayPal. You hold USD on one end, you send it to someone else through the Bitcoin network, and they convert it into pesos or whatever currency they're going to need there, and they hold it in the local currency. So Bitcoin is just a transfer mechanism. Obviously, PayPal still has time. They could do a similar thing. If eBay accepted Bitcoin, it would be a clear difference between eBay selling and Amazon selling. eBay selling could take Bitcoin, and that's what eBay needs. Exit question. In five years, PayPal is the same a Bitcoin company. A historical footnote. Christoph Atlas. I was just looking up some information. So um, in 2002, um, eBay acquired PayPal. And at the time, PayPal, or sorry, eBay had a subsidiary called Billpoint, which was their, their kind of checkout mechanism 
and they were very happy for BillPoint to uh, die a painful death uh, by replacing it with PayPal. And so I, I could see uh, something similar happening with PayPal. Maybe pay PayPal um, is largely gutted and replaced with kind of a, a Bitcoin-based uh, version of it. And I think one of the advantages would be that Bitcoin is an international currency that cannot be stopped by governments. And so, uh, but where PayPal, whereas PayPal, whenever they want to spread to a new country, they have to do some pretty incredible negotiations with the, the local bankers there. Um, I know at least as of a, a few years ago, I don't know if this is still the case, they still didn't have PayPal in Japan, even though they've been trying to do this for, for years. Whereas Bitcoin doesn't necessarily have that problem, or at least the negotiations are going to go uh, according to a different kind of uh, a line of neg negotiation. So I, I would see maybe uh, PayPal, whether it has the same name or not, might be uh, changed into something more cryptocurrency-based. Christoph's description has me thinking of PayPal like Caesar, surrounded by enemies who all say that they're PayPal's friends. Will, how long will PayPal last? That is a tough question because five years is a lot of time. I mean, if you think about the last five years, you're thinking of the entire lifespan of Bitcoin. And we've seen incredible iterations and innovations on the blockchain technology and, and related things. So, man, I guess I think the safest answer is the same, but I don't think that's entirely true. I mean, they won't be a Bitcoin company I don't think. Um, maybe, I don't even think you can classify Circle as a Bitcoin company uh, based on anything I've known about what they're working on. But um, yeah, it, it'll be a payment processor company. So in that sense, it'll be the same. And perhaps they'll have some Bitcoin tools, cryptocurrency tools, and perhaps they won't. And they'll just be happy um, you know, to continue processing credit card payments over email and um, as long as they're able to do that. Marnie Melrose. Well, I actually, uh, I just got a client away from PayPal and moved him over to uh, Bitcoin um, because uh, PayPal had deemed that he had done something nefarious or something, and, and uh, he hadn't, but it looked like that to him. And so they seized, you know, a, a good $20,000 of his money for a bit, and he's still fighting them with that. And, uh, you know, even a few years ago, it's like about three years ago, they did the same thing to me. It was a much smaller amount. And uh, there was a perfectly good explanation, but they grabbed onto the money. And you know what? Small businesses don't really like that. They, they kind of get a little bit pissed off by that. <laughs> and uh, so if they see an opportunity to have something that's going to add more, less friction, right? frictionless movement of money and that's really I think probably the the biggest thing in Bitcoin is that friction, frictionless movement of money around the world um, I'm saying PayPal if they don't do something soon I'll give them three years Davi Barker I actually think two of these answers are the same thing I, I think that uh, if, if if that that not changing and being a footnote in history are actually the same answer because yeah. if they don't change it's the world around them that will change and die. that is what will make them a footnote in history so uh, I guess the question is just are they going to become a Bitcoin company and uh, I actually think it's more likely that a company like eBay would than a company like PayPal because PayPal is a money transmitter which means that they are much more uh, they're already entrenched in financial regulations now, which means that they are going to be more cautious than a merchant, and as a result, probably less likely to change. So, um, you know, it might be the death nail of PayPal. I mean, how exciting would that be if, like, a technology is invented and within 10 years, like, the largest sort of online payment transmitting service is, is out of business? Uh, I think that's actually entirely likely. When it happens, they'll act like they knew it was happening the whole time. Can they I jump in? Change for, or die. For one sec, Tom. Okay. Um, I'm speaking at the International Money Transfer Conference here in San Diego in January. And so all of the major money transmitters, and this is the annual uh, thing, I, I'm sure that... Uh, I'm sure that... 
PayPal is going to be there. And uh, so I'll give you a report afterwards and let you know what I hear. How about that? We'll see if PayPal even has a keychain, because I have both a Bitcoin <laughs> and a Litecoin keychain, but I've never gotten a PayPal keychain before. That's important to survive. HKBitcoinATM.com is having their grand opening this Sunday in Hong Kong. Bitcoin Museum, Meetup Place, and more. Make the Bitcoin robot dance at HKBitcoinATM.com. On a similar note, hundreds attend China's first Bitcoin summit, defying Beijing's warning. China, issue three, China Bitcoin boom. China is ignoring warnings or perhaps heeding them as good advice and getting into Bitcoin anyway. Hundreds attended the Bitcoin conference in China and Bitcoin businesses are moving offshore to get away from influence and plan to continue operating. Is Bitcoin truly the cyberpunk international currency of the future now that it is both banned and actively in use worldwide? Will Pengman. Um, yeah, I think so. Maybe not the kind of, um, maybe not what the original cyberpunks had envisioned, but so, you know, what we, what you have with Bitcoin is something that forces you to understand what money is in the first place. If you want to, if you're new to this and you wonder what it is, um, and why the invention of the blockchain, you know, this timestamp ledger that's updated in real time by everyone, uh, if you, if you want to attempt to understand what that is, um, you need to, in many cases, many folks I talk to, uh, have to re-examine money and, and what that means, you know, um, and what it, what it symbolizes and everything, how it's created in the first place. So this is a really cool process because it allows people's um, uh, understanding to be much deepened, uh, you know, as they re-examine some of these things that they've been using all their life and thought they known very well all their life, but really come to realize they don't when, when something as paradigm shifting and important comes along like a black swan like Bitcoin. So, um, so yeah, people are having to relearn um, what is property, what is security, what is money, and that allows a lot of uh, other illusions about our society to drop for people. So this is like an unraveling of the onion organic process that I know a lot of people in a lot of different kinds of movements throughout history have tried to impose through their activism, through their um, public speaking, through their writing, loud proclamations, whatever it may be. Anyone who's bucking the status quo is really selling hard um, this unraveling of the onion process. But coming to something like Bitcoin and having it be so neutral and basic allows people to do this unraveling of the onion process kind of on their own and that's the only way that anyone really ever changes their mind so that's really cool um, and I'm again you can be in the most totalitarian you know superpower nation out there and we could debate which one that is but let's say it's China you're still gonna have people who are compelled through just their human nature, birthright, their energy, their, you know, their lifeblood, their livelihood, um, the de desire for productivity and fulfillment in life, um, or have an idea and they know it can help people and so they want to share it and they're going to go to all ends to share it no matter what, no matter where they are. So yeah, this is going to happen in countries around the world and as Andreas likes to point out, the countries that have the more transparent or overt totalitarian attitude towards anything in society end up with much less respect for these rules from their populace, from the body politic. And they make a job out of disobeying these regulations and rules. And they actually it becomes kind of socially acceptable to do so as long as, you know, like even among the, um, the enforcement class, if you will. You know, like uh, breaking the law in, in Russia after the wall fell was like a way of life for everyone. And um, that's one of the reasons why organized crime rose to such prominence right after the wall fell in Russia. Um, so, yes, you're, that's an unfortunate consequence. But w and, and I'm not in favor of, you know, different thugs taking over for the previous thugs. But I think with, with something like Bitcoin, what you have is uh, the, the ability for more and more people to see something working in practice that defies the propaganda. And that allows them to, learn, you know, re-examine these things on their own. 
which is really exciting. It's a, pr it's a fun process to watch your friends go through. Just stay friends with them long enough. Be kind and friendly with them long enough, even though their, their economics or their history or their social view or their whatever, their cultural view is uh, abrasive to you. Stay friends with them long enough and, and, and whatever, and you'll see them come around as, as Bitcoin becomes more mainstream. And this is why I'm so optimistic about you know what this means for us around the world. If so, you know the U.S. cracks down on it, um, yeah, it's gonna suck for a while for U.S. citizens and whatever. But the rest of the world's gonna still go on, and you can find pockets of freedom everywhere. Marnie Melrose. So um, I used to live in Bangkok, Thailand for ten months, and uh, my ex-husband, uh, we were involved in international business, and I spent a lot of time in South. Southeast Asia. And I can tell you that the black markets in Asia are the biggest markets in the world. And I got Apple's OS 8, if you can remember that far back, OS 8, um, uh, and anyways, I got it down at a little black market in Bangkok, Thailand. And it was like seriously less than 24 hours they had had that thing cracked and hacked and ready to go out the door. Okay, so the thing is, is that the Chinese and and all you have to do is go to fiatleak.com and watch the money flow into China. I can tell you that the business people of China could care less what their government thinks. They're just going to do whatever it is they're going to do anyways. <laughs> and so you know, I I think uh, I mean you think about Hong Kong. Hong Kong is is the country where everybody goes, and I notice your little Hong Kong ATM thing there. You know why they wanna they want to you know publicly come out right now is because whenever anything gets shut down in China, it just moves to Hong Kong. I mean, it's no big deal. They just move it to Hong Kong. They run out of Hong Kong. They're set, right? And uh, so really there's always a way around it and, and they're not going to slow down. Yes, like the mass is going to slow down, but the the underground movers and shakers, it could really care less. They're just going to do what they're going to do anyways and they're going to keep on doing whatever the heck they want to do. And and that's the way it is in China and all of the, the Asian countries. The underground is very, very big. Davi Barker. I feel like this is what we've been saying from the very beginning. Like, it gets banned, and we use it anyway. Like, this is this is why they've been calling it the honey badger of money. This is why Bitcoin was created and designed the way that it was in the first place, was so that you could ignore it being banned. So, of course, if it's banned somewhere, it continues to be used. I, I, don't, I don't feel like this is even newsworthy. That's what we've been saying, but the market keeps saying the opposite. Christoph, Atlas... Um, Bitcoin is not yet the cyberpunk currency of the future. It has some very significant weaknesses before it can grow into that position. I think it will eventually, but particularly in the area of privacy, it's quite weak. Um, designing software to track people on a very large scale in Bitcoin is maybe like a two-month project for a small government contractor team. And you can be sure that the U.S., various uh, branches of the U.S. military, in fact, probably they've hired multiple contractors in the same branch of the mil U.S. military because they just have all this money to burn um, when they're not just you know letting it fall off the back of a truck in Iraq. And you can be sure that China is doing the same and Australia and Germany and all these other places. So uh, we still have a lot of work to do in that area. And I don't think that the market has quite wrapped its head around what the potential is for Bitcoin in terms of how people can use it to evade capital controls, how in some countries people will be able to use it to avoid sales taxes or other kinds of taxes. I don't think that the market has wrapped its head around it yet because I haven't seen the kind of funding of these crucial projects that we need in order to advance these privacy features. Um, and so I think that's coming down the, the line, but um, the, you know, our, honestly, the, the sooner that we work on this, the better off we will be in the long run. Exit question. Will more countries attempt to ban Bitcoin? Will they be just as successful? Will Pangman, are you back with us? Moving on to Mighty, Marnie Melrose. Yeah, so I think, um, sorry about that. 
uh, yeah, I think more countries will definitely try to ban it. Um, I don't do that. I think that they'll be as successful. Probably not. Um, because it's, I mean, China is a totally totalitarian. It is like the most Machiavellian, you know, you know, control everything country on the face of the planet. Um, but like I said, when the people decide that they're going to do what they're going to do, they just go and do it anyways. And um, that is kind of a strength of China. Now, will the country, will the people inside of these other countries that are going to be banned, will they be as strong as the Chinese people and continue on? That remains to be seen because they're not used to those controls like the Chinese are. And the Chinese just find ways around things, right? All of the Asians do. They just find a way around. It's no big deal. Um, but other countries, yeah, you know, their people go, oh, you know, and like they do here in, in America, the price goes down, oh, oh we, can't, we can't do that, we can't do that, you know, oh, in the UK, oh my God, if it was banned in the UK, it would be totally, oh, we can't do that, can't possibly do that, you know. <laughs> if you um, asked a shop to take Bitcoin, they'd think you were a criminal already. Yeah. Oh, criminal currency, can't have any of that. <laughs> Isn't that illegal? <laughs> Very much so. Cheerio. <laughs> so let's say let's go backwards. Will Pangman? Will more countries ban Bitcoin? Uh, yeah, I think I agree with Marty. They probably will try. Um, I think you'll probably see it banned in more, even more local regions or local economies. Like, you know, there'll be a state ban. Some state, like some backwards state, like I don't know, Ohio. You know, pick on Ohio or West Virginia or something. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, uh, we'll see that. Um, again, you, you've got lots of places in, in, in America that view certain social issues very differently from each other, and um, there's very backwards from each other, just, you know, for example, from Illinois to Indiana, you know, just, there's a lot, uh, you know, if you live in the Chicagoland area by the border, you have to be very careful what you have in your car when you drive between the states, right? So, um, it's it's probably going to be something like that we'll see. And, and some of these other countries, you know, I, I think their spirit of disobedience um, is alive and well in humanity, you know, in large part thanks to how quickly information travels these days. So more and more people can, you know, have a glimpse of what it's like on the other side of the world or, you know, on the other side of the fence in some cases. So, uh, yeah, I'm... Um, I'm... Uh, I, I think the um, the resilient spirit of, of, of people and, and nations that try to really clamp down on Bitcoin, and, and some of these nations I think will quickly realize that they cannot succeed in doing so and just look foolish in attempting to do so, transparently um, inept to to people, to neighboring nations and, and, and body politic, bodies politic. And uh, so, yeah, we, we'll, we won't see, we might see it attempted and then it'll just not be a thing that anyone tries to do. I think there'll always be room in the let's let's look foolish club for nations. Christoph Atlas. Yeah, of course more governments will try to ban uh, Bitcoin. Essentially, here's what's going to be the effect in the long run. All these different websites that we use to look at where Bitcoin is being used in the world, we're going to have to close those websites down because it's going to end up just being a random pattern uh, that looks exactly like the Tor network. And we're going to have to, you know, we won't be able to get uses, use the blockchain.info or uh, block explorer as much because all the transactions will just be uh, coin join transactions. So that's going to be the end effect is that they're going to make some of these websites a little bit less useful in terms of uh, tracking Bitcoin, but that's about all that they can do. The golden age of open Bitcoin tracking. Mm -hmm. Davi Barker. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Banning things is what governments do. So, um, you know, there there are there are two sort of characteristics of Bitcoin that make it ideal for for banning. Uh, one is it frees people, and two is it's confusing. So, yes, governments will continue to ban it. Let us put the hammer down. Moving on. Did you know? The Bitcoin Group has its own website with donation information at thebitcoingroup.com. The Bitcoin Group on the World Wide Web. It's amazing, yes? Astounding, maybe. The Bitcoin Group is also on the World Crypto Network. 
WorldCryptoNetwork.com. Subscribe for daily YouTube shows about Bitcoin. New shows every day. Issue 4. Bitcoin businesses continue to earn big funding. BitPay raised $30 million. Kraken raised $5 million. And MadeSafe raised $5 million as well. There seems to be no question that well-funded companies like these will continue to build the Bitcoin ecosystem. What new technology, company, or Bitcoin business are you inspired by? Marnie Melrose. Oh, you're going to have to come back to me on that one. Let Tommy me Barker. <laughs> well, I suppose of the ones on the list, I use BitPay. And um, I've been very happy with their services. They essentially function like PayPal, which lets me sort of transition off of PayPal. And um, they've made it very easy for me to get in and out of the currency when I need to, um, if I ever end up short on fiat for some reason. Um, but I suppose the one, the, like the company I'm most impressed with is blockchain.info and now uh, blockchain.com. Uh, you know, ideologically, I, I know those guys are real sort of strong free market folks, and um, I see them sponsoring good events. I see them tabling. I see them merchandising. I see them. They're continuing to develop new and innovative products in their field, and they're also of all the sort of um, merchant services out there. They're the ones who are really interested in privacy and the protection of the user. And so, um, of all the companies out there, they're my favorite. Christoph Atlas. I am uh, kind of per per perplexed by MadeSafe. Not really sure what to make of the project yet. It's such a grand project, and really all the projects that I've seen that have been on a similar scale have remained vaporware because it's just... It's too much. and um, But we do, like I said earlier, I've been sort of thinking about recently this idea of Satoshi as a necromancer because there's all these technologies that came out in the, the 90s through the cypherpunk movement, and they were just weren't able to go anywhere. Uh, they either um, stayed very small, which is true of the Tor network, or they just they died out, and they were what they were lacking essentially was a price discovery mechanism. Um, Jonathan Mohan has talked about this recently on Let's Talk Bitcoin as the, the his idea of let there be price, and what Bitcoin gives us is, is a template for technology for a price discovery mechanism and a way to incentivize people to to operate in new networks, a financial incentive, and so all of a sudden. Um, you know, all this technology for mesh networking and anonymous e-cash and, um, you know, all, all kinds of stuff is just being resurrected from the dead um, from a, a decade or more ago. And we're seeing a wellspring of new ideas. And really, BaitSafe, in a lot of ways, is a resurrection of a bunch of, of older ideas that people uh, had instilled in, in older projects that just couldn't get off the ground. So I think that... Maybe that's the answer for something like MadeSafe is now we have this price discovery mechanism. Now we have a way of giving people money to, to use the stuff that we want them to use. And uh, maybe that's how things like that actually happen. And it would be an incredible opportunity for humanity to, to liberate ourselves from this highly centralized uh, inter inf internet infrastructure. We certainly saw an incredible burst in dark, dark coin price. Perhaps people do want to be anonymous. Will Pangman. Yeah, I'm going to echo uh, Davi with uh, both of his answers. You know, uh, BitPay is incredibly inspiring. Just, you know, the relationships that they're putting together around the world and also in the U.S. with different um, partners that they are going to need to increase their market penetration, which they've done so consistently every time I turn around you know it's it's so impressive they're doing something that's very very important they're basically building incredible tools that are ready at the flip of a switch as soon as hundreds of thousands of people decide that they want in on bitcoin you know business owner you know merchants in particular they'll all they'll have to do is basically flip a switch because at, you know bitpay is increasingly um, incorporating other, uh, you know, different hardware terminals, um, point, point of sale terminals. They're developing software tools to work with almost anything out there. Most 
uh, point of sale terminals are going towards the iPad or tablet route anyway, and th they're already plug and play in that respect. So that is so huge and um, really like encouraging. Uh, again, blockchain.info. Um, for all the reasons Davi mentioned, I totally agree. They're very inspiring. Uh, the one in particular that I really appreciate as I work for um, uh, a Bitcoin startup that um, essentially seeks to do a lot of the same things from a business plan standpoint that blockchain is doing, which is function without a bank account, which uh, you know a company like the one I'm working for, Topiki.com, we won't need a bank account to function. Um, but uh, that's, a, that's an important trait that blockchain.info has that I think is so admirable. I mean, there are so many headaches that they don't have to worry about or use you know, the traditional banking system. And that allows them to be incredibly nimble and innovative, and uh, we've seen this with their, their partnerships. The other thing I really love about blockchain is uh, I know Nick and um, some of the other executives there are hot on the trail of any and all um, apps out there or you know different Bitcoin um, programs and things like that that just are seeking to simplify the user experience or streamline um, make more appealing the user experience for the average computer user um, which again is something we we need to do as an industry so that we can increase adoption so for those two reasons I am a huge fan of both BitPay and blockchain Marty Melrose. Hang on. Uh, you know, I I still don't have an answer. Uh, I'll say, like, for instance, you were talking about BitPay. One thing that I like about BitPay that they are working on is cosign. I think that that's really needed, especially from a business standpoint. Having a multi-signature account where you've got, you know, the the directors of the company. I think that that's that's something that's really needed. Um, if a company is to accept Bitcoin and, and remain in Bitcoin um, and authorize those transactions, I think that that's really important. Um, I, I see little different pieces in so many different companies that I like, right? It's like if I could take this from there and this from there and this from there, then I would have the perfect company. But I don't have that company yet. Um, you know, I, I'm talking to XAPO about some of the stuff that they're doing, greenaddress.it, blockchain.info, you know, the, the monolith Coinbase, you know, and, uh, and, and BitPay as well. And, and like I said, I, I, for me, I, it's too early for me to have a favorite yet. I'm just not there yet. I like your idea of the Franken company. All the companies yeah. put together to give us what we want. <laughs> Moving on to questions and answers. What are your thoughts after the first glimpse of Circle? What do you guys think? Do we need a Bitcoin service where you store your money in fiat, you send your money in Bitcoin, and then you store your money in fiat? Davi. Um, I prefer not to store my money in fiat. I mean, that sort of... Um... I don't, you don't see the point. Uh, so, well, it uses the transfer protocol, but it is an interesting adaptation, another middleman. Chris, yeah, I mean, for, for people that don't want to hold Bitcoin and just want to use it as a payment system, that's cool. But that's not the most exciting function of the blockchain for me anyway. So, um, mm. Christoph, what do you think? To me, Circle looks like a basic Bitcoin bitch. Um, you know, it's, this is some, some PayPal, PayPal 2.0 stuff. And uh, it personally doesn't interest me. They took a, a while to announce it, but now it's here. Will, what do you think? Send yeah, I think, I think it's, like, it's kind of a no-brainer idea. It's weird that no like, traditional Bitcoin players, if you will, um, have explored or at least had said anything about doing something similar. I do see some interesting use cases. Like you pointed out when you, when you sort of walked through one use case earlier, Tom, you know, if someone from the U.S. wants to use the Bitcoin rails or the pipes, as Marnie was discussing earlier, to send, you know, through currency exchange, I mean, that's saving tons of time and hopefully some money, too. We don't know what Circle's fees are going to be for something like that, but, you know, that's, that's a great use case, you know. Um, 
I, I also think that some of the... I, I have my ear to the ground with a couple of companies uh, who are coming out like in the next couple days or couple weeks with some really new like peripheral apps on their platform that will do something similar to kind of what Circle announced, um, but basically everything stays in crypto. You know what I mean? So <laughs> Exactly the opposite. <laughs> right, yeah. right, but... Um, I'm not. I'm not going to spill any beans because I don't know what I should share or not. But uh, I want them to enjoy their um, day in the sun and stuff. But basically, I think these other Bitcoin companies that have been mainstays in the space for more than a year, you know, which is a long time, um, longer than Circle, uh, they have ideas coming out that will basically, for the most, for the large section of current Bitcoin users, which is a ton of people, uh, will have favorability over what Circle's providing. What Circle's providing, you know, might be something that works in the background when people want to send money. Like, maybe Circle's competing with Western Union, and that's it, you know? I don't know. So, yeah, I'm not that impressed by Circle. I'm very suspicious of them that, you know, just, just some of the... It's been vaporware up until today, pretty much. So, um, we'll see. Ah, uh, but now it's real. Marnie Melrose, your thoughts on Circle? So, um... Well, I have my personal thoughts, and then I have my greater adoption thoughts, and uh, so I'll take, like me personally, I, I don't want anybody to have any information about me and, and how much Bitcoin I have or do not have, right? And so uh, I'm more on the side of, yes, and I, I want to stay in Bitcoin. Um, you know, and then there's the idea of, of debit cards where you can stay in Bitcoin, right? But you could use the Visa MasterCard thing. But it's kind of like it's almost doing a disservice to Bitcoin, right? And I know that doesn't have anything to do with Circle, but trust me, I'll, I'll tie it all together in a second. And then there's, you know, uh, it, it's definitely for Circle anyways. I was just speaking at the Torrey Pines uh, Rotary Club, and there was this guy there, super wealthy. He needed to move $800,000 from the United States into a German bank account. And he's like, how would I do that in Bitcoin? And, you know, I had to like, yeah, you do this over here, and then you do that over there. And, yeah, so I would like that transaction to happen in Bitcoin. Um you know, and, and if there's going to be a company that's going to make that happen and it is going to benefit the Bitcoin network, then, I, then I'm all for it. Um, would I use them myself? Probably not. But would that help to get greater adoption and, and understanding of Bitcoin? If it does, then that's what I'm for. Because at the end of the day, for me, it's not about, you know, uh, whether it's... Uh, it's greater adoption of the entire Bitcoin idea, right? And the technology behind Bitcoin. That's what I want. I want everybody using Bitcoin in any little way that they can. Um, and I don't want to force them to have to do it one way or another. I just want everybody using it. Make sense? It does seem like Square or Circle or whatever they call themselves may be another middleman, mm -hmm. but they're using Bitcoin. They're still Bitcoin's middlemen. I think we need them. I think it's going to be quietly brilliant. People that you don't think about now are going to use it. Yeah. Moving on to other questions. Is there a crypto-based fund or movement to compete with the big Internet providers? Not really. I think the closest thing you've got there is maybe something like Open, uh, open Garden, where you have a mesh network that could perhaps compete with the major Internet providers. Competing with the people who own the pipes is such a large undertaking. They have the physical equipment already, and they're rolling out new fiber and other things, so it's incredibly difficult to compete. I, I have a thought on that. You know, I, I know of a project called Meowbit. I'm not um, very well versed in it, but um, uh, I know one of Davi's colleagues is, uh, is, is one of the head guys of, of Meowbit, and I, to me, that seems like a, a solution uh, of dealing with some of these internet choke points. Davi, do, can you elaborate, or...? Yeah, well, Meowbit is essentially an application to sort of facilitate the Namecoin uh, DNS system, although Michael W. Dean has called BitShares the Namecoin killer, and so he sort of anticipates... Uh, I guess BitShares is launching a DNS system as well that is, is decentralized but has some different sort of features 
I don't know. That's gonna that's gonna have to come out in the wash as users adopt both of them. Neither of them feel like they're ready for prime time. Um, but the point is, is that there's a need, and so people are uh, seeking that out. As far as like the physical equipment, that's that's true. Like laying fiber optic cable, like a DNS system is not going to replace the physical equipment. Um, but you know, the advance of technology is going to make that easier to compete with over time. So I mean, it's just a matter of time. And we need we need a, a new internet infrastructure far far more than we need a new DNS system. Um, frankly, our existing DNS system works perfectly fine um, in the vast majority of situations, but not so much the uh, the internet infrastructure. We're running out of time, so let's move on to predictions or final thoughts or story of the week. Davi Barker, do you have a prediction or a story? Oh, coming at me first. Okay, let's see predictions. Um, Second, let's see. We also have a point to raise that you can join in on the Hoodie for Homeless fundraiser at BitcoinNotBombs.com. Every time you order a T-shirt from Bitcoin Not Bombs, they'll buy a hoodie and give it to someone in need. Last year, in 2013, we distributed more than 325 hoodies to the homeless in San Francisco. Buy a T-shirt today. Help us break our goal for next year. There you go, Dolly. Well, thank you for stalling for me. Uh, so I actually <laughs> do have a prediction. There was a story recently that there are a few um, uh, political candidates who are accepting Bitcoin as as a donation model, and FEC has has that's the federal. I don't even know what it stands for. <laughs> FEC has federal been, election commission. There you go. Uh, FEC has decided that it is okay for them to accept Bitcoin as long as they uh, have reasonable scrutiny that that Bitcoin was not acquired through illicit activities. I don't know how they're going to determine that. <laughs> but my prediction is that they will not raise more than $100 in Bitcoin. I don't think that the Bitcoiners of the world are interested in donating to political campaigns. Christoph Atlas. Well, something that I talked about in Dark News on, on Thursday, <clears throat> just yesterday, was um, there are some there are some wonderful new privacy features that are being worked on in Dark Coin, Dark Wallet. Um, there's uh, even some some amazing uh, privacy technologies that have been kind of flying under the radar for a little while in the form of uh, Crypto Note and uh, a few other projects. And basically what these all mean is that pretty soon we will be able to trade cryptocurrency in a, nuts, in a much more anonymous fashion with some, some actual mathematical uh, guarantees on exactly how much blockchain anonymity we can get out of these technologies. And we will be freed from the possibility of uh, FBI or NSA or GCHQ uh, honey traps, honey pots for our cryptocurrencies because you know of course that's been the problem with these you know the way that we get anonymity in the past is what if your um, Bitcoin fog mixing service is actually just being run by you know the CIA or something uh, there's no way to know because they tried to be anonymous too and um, anyone that's anonymous can be the CIA as well so um, this is something that's being worked on and should be fixed in a very significant way in the next, let's say, eight months or so. And that's actually, people have not yet got a sense of, of how enormous that is because it, it closes one of the last uh, really important windows when it comes to cryptocurrency privacy. Will Pangman. Um, I guess I'm going to go with the story of the week this time. Um, and it, this is just something that just came to me, and I'm just going to go with it. Uh, Glenn Beck hosting Jeffrey Tucker, Elizabeth Ploche, and our very own oh, Christoph cool. Atlas. Um, I guess they did a 45-minute interview, and I saw two short seven-minute or so videos of, of what they did, and I thought uh, all three of our colleagues did a fantastic job of delivering this uh, information to that audience. And I also think, you know, I'm, I'm no fan of Glenn Beck, and I don't think any of the people who went to meet him were fans of him either. Uh, necessarily, but um, you know, from what I heard, had nothing but nice things to say. And the fact that he was so—I mean, you never—I you, you almost never see. Um, it's so funny. There are two people who have brought Bitcoin to millions of ears and eyes who have never. 
before heard the term or had totally discarded it because of a 30-second CNBC news blurb. And they are Joe Rogan and Glenn Beck. And they brought this stuff to two completely different demographic audiences. And they also both admitted repeatedly that they were stupid about this when they were you know, seeking more information about it, in Rogan's case from Andreas a couple times, and in Beck's case from, you know, Christoph, Elizabeth, and, and Jeffrey Tucker. So this is something you don't see on cable news and from major, you know, pundits who have major-sized audiences. You don't see them disarming themselves. You don't see them totally uh, exposing vulnerability or calling themselves stupid. And so I think this is... Uh, maybe not the best thing to admit in general, even for anybody. I'm not uh, applauding that. But I do think it shows that they were both curious. And I talk about this all the time. I know Adam B. Levine mentions this a lot, too. If you're not curious about cryptocurrency and you're talking about it like you know about it, then you're, you know, you're making a fool of yourself. And if you are curious, then you're honest about how much you know and don't know and what you want to know and what you don't want a part of and what you do. And so, anyway... Both of all these kinds of things are very, very positive for adoption. Bringing it to people again, we can start the unraveling of the onion process as they take a hands-on approach to this thing. The more comfortable when they hear someone they trust, like Joe Rogan's hardcore fans trust him um, because he's helped them with the material and the guests that he's had on in previous shows. So they trust him. He's brought them intelligent people who help them change their lives in small ways that they appreciated. Same is true of Glenn Beck and his demographic. So you know. Uh, whether you agree with the guy or not is beside the point. The fact of the matter is um, the people that trust him, the millions that trust these men, have, have um, now heard an objective um, view of, of Bitcoin, and they have actually fair chance to decide if this is something that has a, a place in their life, like Marty said, just in a small way. So I think most of them are realizing that it probably does, especially based on their favorite spokesperson's endorsement or, you know, um, entertainment of the, the issue. So again, that is a huge, that's a huge news item from the week that a lot of people just want to attack Glenn Beck or dismiss Glenn Beck or whatever um, and, and we don't highlight, even if we totally disagree with the guy and all of the other stuff, the ridiculous you know, show that's been put on in the past, uh, need to appreciate the kind of impact that this, um, the delivery of this information to that audience can have. So huge thumbs up. Uh, thank you, Christoph and Elizabeth and Jeffrey. If you watch this, thank you both. So you did. Everyone hit a home run. I, I was very impressed, especially with Christoph, to be honest. Me too. Thank you very much. And I wanted to say about Glenn Beck. Um, before the show and after the show, when people heard that I was doing this, I heard from a lot of people that said, "Oh, Glenn Beck is just." Um, you know, he's just a, he's only a political pundit. He takes his talking points from Karl Rove and the neoconservatives and all this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, let me tell you, Karl Rove is not, not going to be a fan of Bitcoin. It's not going to work well for him. So I'm not saying that Glenn Beck is, um, you know, my, is a thought leader for me or uh, that I, I want to follow exactly on his footsteps, but I was very impressed. Like, it would have been so easy for him to invite some other douchebag onto the show and, you know, some pro some Professor Bitcoin to uh, talk about how it's going to uh, cause a deflationary spiral and volatility and blah, blah, blah. Like, he actually brought some knowledgeable people on the show to explain this stuff, and I was really impressed by that choice and by his humility on this topic and just, you know, his, his open-mindedness about it. So, you know, people cut, cut him some slack and... Um, he certainly has my appreciation for um, furthering the the interests of Bitcoin in that fashion. Absolutely, and I would add to that. He, he was so basically he did a classy job. You guys all did a really classy job, and I I love seeing that, and I'd like to see more of that. And my prediction is there will be more of that, and there will be more of these major people. You know, uh, Colbert Report, Bill Mayer. Uh, all, all sorts of these crazy people, you know, who have massive, really, like, volatile audiences, w whether they believe one way or the other. But if we can be, my hope is that we can be 
as open and as gracious towards them as we can so that we can get our message heard there, right? Rather than if we align ourselves too much with one idea, ideology or another, then, then we can't get massive mainstream. So we have to be a little bit more neutral, well at least I do anyways, maybe not all you guys, but I have to be a little bit more neutral in order to get to the masses. And, and um, you know, sometimes you have to play in other gardens in order to, to spread your seeds. <laughs> Very well said. And finally, my prediction, Bitcoin Jesus, Roger Veer is predicting that Amazon will start accepting Bitcoin and I'm joining him. Amazon is not going to let eBay just let this one go by. The only difference between buying a used book on Amazon and buying a used book on eBay could be that eBay accepts Bitcoin. If eBay does it, Amazon will have to follow and fast. Amazon would much rather be the leader. Why not go first, Amazon? Until next time, we're out of time. Bye-bye. Bye. So long. See you later.